start right off with the, the, it's it's there's a lot of excitement going on at USC. And, and to be quite honest with you, for somebody that was around this program a year ago, so, um, it's it's just it's light years difference. And we're here with, with Dante Williams, who you know has has become a rising star as far as as, as co young coaches are. Because you're still young, dude. I'm the old guy. Um, <laughs> but just well, I mean, basically, we'll start off with this. USC hired a new athletic director. And I think that was the, the, the beginning of what we're seeing right now. And, and the byproduct was, was hiring some really, really good people. And I'm just, from, from a guy from Los Angeles, what, with the support from an athletic department, how, what, what does USC offer? I mean, it just seems like I've always felt that USC, the sky was the limit. If USC wanted to go all in on football, it was going to be hard for anybody to compete with USC. And it just feels like that's where it's going right now. Uh, the sky's the limit for SC. I mean, and what it has to offer is an Ivy League education, right? The Ivy League education in a major, major city, the number one college market in the world as far as college athletics. So you have the name, image, and likeness situation that's about to come up. That's big. Uh, you're in a major city that has, you know, capabilities to do anything in which you want to do, whether it's be a movie star, whether it's to I don't know, direct an, an acting film or whether it's to go to the beach, amusement park, or go ski in Big Bear at Mandeville. So, I mean, you have the, you know, the capabilities of, of anything and as far as the city life, you have professional sports teams, you have major college athletics, uh, major when, like I said, when it comes to academics, but at the same time, like, you know, you have great people. And it's people from all over the world that come to California. And one of the main things is because the job market. I mean, when you look at Los Angeles, uh, you know, it's, it's never going to be enough jobs, but at the same time, it's jobs in all kind of different types of fields, whether it's engineering or whether to be a doctor or whatever the case may be, it's one of those places where you go there with dreams and you make your dreams come true. And, and to get kids, you know, you, you always you want to lock, lock up the top of local town. We, we've heard that for years. That was Pete Carroll's main thing when he first got to USC. Just make sure we keep the top kids at home. And right now, it feels like that's the direction you guys are going. But to, to, to go to other places in the country right now um, and get commitments and, and get commitments from really, really good players, um, what, how, how challenging is that right now? What, what is the approach that you have to do everything virtually? Uh, I mean, it's, it's hard because those guys can't come on campus. But from a, you know, from a different perspective, I'm fortunate enough to be with guys that work extremely hard. And, you know, everybody could say it's the full-time guys. It's not just the full-time guys. It's the recruiting department. It's the people behind the scenes. It's the graduate assistants, the quality control guys. I mean, everyone is working their tails off right now. And, you know, we, we're all coming together and we have the same mission. And then, like I said it all before, it's to take back the West. But at the same time, the, the one thing that I see the most is the fans and the support is all coming behind us. And that's major. I think, you know, a, a little bit of that have been lost, I guess, over the last couple of years. But right now you can see the support starting to pour back into USC as far as the community, because, I mean, that's that's huge. When you get the fan support, when you get all, you know, the old boosters, the, old, the alumni and everybody else coming back and supporting the program, you see how strong SC is. Did it almost surprise you that this was able to happen? You uh, coming to USC? Oh, that definitely shocks me. Uh, I mean, SC has always been a dream job of mine. I mean, you grew up in LA. I mean, you dream of playing at SC. And once you become a coach, you dream of coaching at SC. Uh, I, you know, started taking a path in my career where I thought it was something that would never happen. And not just because I didn't want it to happen or anything like that. It's just the direction I was going, I, I didn't see that ever happening or unfolding. It kind of came out of left field, I guess, a little bit, but it came at the right time for different reasons, and I'm fortunate yeah. in the situation I'm in. All right, my last question, and until so Mark Colcom will, will, he has some questions as well. <clears throat> um, I was, I, I've, I've known you for, for maybe six or so years, and you and I have maybe talked a little bit over the last two or so, and it, I, I knew what you were capable of doing as a recruiter and as a football coach. The tracker spoke for itself. Kids were always talking about you. You were the reason they were visiting Arizona and Nebraska and, and, and so on. But I wasn't really sh quite aware of, of your reach until you were hired at USC. 
I, how, what, I mean, it's got to take a lot of work and time to get to the point where there's kids all across this country that know you and have a relationship with you really early in the recruiting process. I mean, what is the process of getting to that point as a coach? Uh, I think my players do a great job of speaking on my behalf, I guess. And they sell me better than I can sell myself. So I guess that comes back to making sure you treat everyone fair and everyone the same because I now coach in so many different parts and so many different areas, even going to college. I mean, shoot, went to, way out to Syracuse. So that helps me in the Northeast. That helps me on the East Coast. And, you know, way back when I even started coaching, even in junior college, we were taking so many players from Florida and from Georgia and different places in, in that region where – like, yeah, people could say I just made probably made those connections in the last couple of years, but I didn't. I made those connections over a decade ago. And now it's all starting to pay off because I'm in a certain situation right now where I'm at a great university and I have everything to sell. I mean, it's, it's everything. I mean, it, it, it speaks for itself. I really don't even have to open my mouth or say anything. A kid already knows so much about USC. And now, like I say, like you coach so many different players from all over, and players, all the good players, they all know each other, whether it's from 707 or camps or whatever case, they all know each other. And if you do right by people, they'll do right by you. I lied. Last question, I'm going to follow up on this. But um, I, I asked, I, I don't know if I can say names of, of guys that signed at other schools or not, but there was a five-star kid from Southern California that transferred to Florida and um, ended up at a school in the SEC. And I asked him what the impact was going to be of, of USC hiring you. And the, it was just a really short reply. Dante is going to finally get everybody. And um, it, it seems like the, the, what it comes back to is there's, there's a trust factor going on. And how do you establish trust with, with a lot of these kids who, for valid reasons, have trust issues? Uh, I think it's being honest and upfront. I mean, one of the big things is like, you know, when I left the past school and I came to SC, everybody could think I just, it happened overnight. That did not happen overnight. My players were very aware of the situation and what was going on in my life, even the course of the football season. So once it all came to fruition, like I was open and honest and talked to them before I even made that decision to, to come to USC, you know? So it wasn't like I just came and I left those guys hanging out. I'm not that kind of person. So I, whether I was open with them, I was open with those kids' parents. So. I'm very open and very honest. And my players, you know, just like, you know, I'm, I'm into their life, they're in my life too. So they know a big part of the things that are going on. And I'm not a person who's going, you know, it's not just a coach-player relationship. You know, it's a coach-player relationship when we step on this football field. We step on this football field is a coach-player relationship. But mm -hmm. as we step off this field, it's make sure that I'm somebody who's maturing young men to become grown men, to become adults. And to make sure that when they get older, they're not me, they're better than me. And that's the big thing, I guess, that I take. I want to make sure, like, all the mistakes I made in the past, whatever it could be, I don't, it could be just, I don't know, walking down the wrong street, whatever the case may be, I want to make sure those guys live a better life than I ever had and ever will have. So I guess that's, I guess, the main thing for me. Yeah. Mark? Great. Hey, Coach, uh, thanks for being on with us today. Thank you. No. Um, so you, you kind of touched on it for a moment there, Scott, uh, a few minutes ago, where you got into coaching. It kind of came out of left field. Um, do you remember what it was that you said it kind of the light bulb went off and you said, this is it. This is what I want to do. And I'm pretty darn good at it. Uh, as far as as far as coaching. Yeah. Overall or coming to SC? Overall. Overall. Uh, no. <laughs> so. Uh, me coaching period, I still wanted to play, but I had my ankle reconstructed. So my ankle was reconstructed. Uh, you know, at that time I had, you know, a really close friend, uh, and his name's Chris Ellison. So, it, you know, is the older brother of Kevin Ellison, ex Trojan. So Chris, you know, played during college and he actually go, went on and he played at BYU and everything else. He said, I have, I have a former teammate and, you know, he's a head coach now. He said, why don't you go out there and just talk to him? So I went and talked to him and, you know, he actually offered me the job to be the, you know, defensive back coach at Harvard Junior College. And now he's at El Camino. So, and we went on from there. And, you know, when I started doing it, it was just something to do. Mm -hmm. After, you know, you started being with those guys every day, I started taking it on like a, a much bigger role than I thought. 
And as far as like, you know, I became the weight coach. And when we didn't have practice, I was out there being the speed and conditioning coach. And I was just doing everything. Like I was there every day so much that you would think I was probably a full-time employee because I was there all the time. And I mean, even on like the weekends, I was working these guys out at 6 a.m. in the morning, like waking them up, taking them to like, it was an all day, every day thing. And to start seeing some of these kids when they started getting their degrees and graduating and going on to college and getting scholarships and everything else, I started realizing that, you know, when you play out, like when I played, I mean, to be honest, I was a little selfish. It was about me. And once I started coaching, you started realizing how much important you were to other people. And it wasn't about me no more. I started getting so happy as far as seeing other people achieve their goals and accomplish things that they wanted. Guys who were, you know, the first person in their family to go to college and, you know, basically all those things. And I started loving it. I started seeing, like seeing other people succeed. And right now, like I, I coach still, you know, it's nothing for me because I did this in a junior college, you know, making no money, it, doing it for, for free. So this was about helping others. And to this day, that's what I'm still all about. I want to make sure these young men accomplish their goals. And that's, you know, for me, that's getting their degree. That's the number one thing to become a man and then the NFL. And if you know what I'm saying, that's the third thing for me or whatever else they want to do out of this, whether it's a doctor, a lawyer or whatever else. Yeah, no, you know, I, I, I don't know what it's like to be a parent. So uh, I do know what it's like to, to coach and to mentor, though. So when you see, as you're talking about, when you see these young men um, grow and go on to that next level, whatever it be, in, you know, sports, life, whatever, it gives you that sense of pride that, you know what, I made a, I made a difference in this, at least in one person's life. And you're able to do that multiple times. Um, and so I can only imagine what that feeling's like. Um, and again, not being a parent, that's what a, I envision that's what a parent feels like when they see their, their son or daughter go off and be successful in life. So I, I, I kind of draw those, those parallels. Because, I mean, I'm sorry to take cut you off, but these, no, two guys, please. these two guys like kind of like always ring to my head. So it was two kids that I was coaching at Harvard, right? At that time, they were kids, now they're grown men. But one went on to Kansas State, one went to Hawaii. The one that went to Kansas State now is a financial advisor. You know, he has a family, got a degree, everything was great, right? The other one went on to Hawaii, came back. He's now a big time cop. So the first day I was at SC, the first day on the job, he comes in there, everybody's like, Dante, the cops is looking for you. So he just walked in. <laughs> like, the cops here for you. So I walk out and they just see me just giving them the biggest hug ever, you know, and those like, it, that's that's the big thing I think of a sign of a good coach and a good man is that your former players are all supporting you and you will be shocked at so many guys I coached from junior college or when I first started coaching because now everybody looks at me like you said a young coach but I want to say shoot this is my fourth I got to add it up now this is my fourth fifth sixth seventh tenth eleventh twelfth thirteenth this will be my 15th season coaching so Damn. in that amount of time I've coached so many people you would be shocked at how many guys have reached out to me about like, oh, this is my cousin. This is my nephew. This is, you know, like a lot of these kids now I have connections with. And it's a lot of these top notch kids that are ninth and 10th graders that are coming up. But those guys, they see what I did for them in the past. So they trust their family with me. And, you know, it's not just DBs. These are I mean uh, D linemen and O linemen and running backs and everything. So the reach is, you know, it's quite far. Okay. Well, I mean, you mentioned that they're not all DBs. The first person, the first person that uh, Julian Simon let know he was going to quit to USC was you. So, you know, when somebody tells me that, that's a, that, that tells me a lot. Um, but I, I, one of the things, too, we're going to ask a little bit about the USC football players, too. But um, with, with recruiting, uh, I sat with, with T. Martin one afternoon. I was supposed to get, like, 50. USC said, you get 10 minutes. I was like, oh, thanks. And uh, – and it's sitting in his office for three hours. And he just, he just kind of went over you know, the recruiting end of it for maybe an hour and a half. And, and, it, and it came back to what you kind of said, relationships. You know, he, but there was a, Bayless Jones, for example, was a kid that was kind of wavering on his commitment to USC. I think he then committed to Oklahoma, but he was close with the father and other people. He had no problem getting in touch with them. So I know that's an important part, but what does it take to, to, to become an elite recruiter? Uh, I think to become a lead, I think, I mean, 
and that's that's not really for me to decide. Like that's really for you all to decide. And okay, all what is it? What the kids? You all talk to to so many kids that you see who the kids are talking about, and I think it, it's it's more than just relationship. It tells you that those guys are working extremely hard, and they're they're working extremely hard to make sure they build a relationship because. In, in all actuality, I don't care if you go to school around the corner or if you go to school 2,000 miles away, right? You, you're going to get homesick because it's nothing like home. Even if it's around the corner, just some fact is you can't go home when you want to. And once you go to college, it becomes an all-day type of thing. I mean, the way you eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you train, you practice, you have meetings, it's all day. And by the time you're done with study hall and everything, you don't have the time to drive maybe, even though your house is 30 minutes away, you don't want to do that. You want to go right around the corner to your dorm or to your apartment. Yeah. And it, it becomes a major, I think, when it comes trust factor in a relationship because you are almost the person in that kid's life on a daily basis. They can call home to their parents, they can call home to their cousins and their relatives, but the person that they see on a daily is you. And if, if there's no true relationship built there, it, you're going to have a, a lot of issues with that kid. The relationship will never be the way it should be. So I think you have to get a chance to really know them. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's their dog's name or brother's and sister's name or how old their siblings are. Like, you want to know what's important to them. But at the same time, you want them to know what's important to you also. Is there I'm sure, gonna, uh, I'm sure there has. Um, you deal with a lot of super talented, uber ego, high testosterone guys on a daily basis, where you say, you know what, I want this guy on my team. I know I can break him, I can mold him into a fine young man. Do you ever, have there any, been any instances where you've considered you failed because you weren't able to, to get that guy to buy in and he went off and maybe ended up on the wrong side of the tracks in life? Uh, you know what? It's How do you crazy. Deal? How do you deal with that? I think, uh, you know, maybe I probably had like one or two guys and for different reasons, I feel like I, I failed or I feel like I let them down. But the crazy thing is both those young men, both, I'm going to say within a matter of six months, both text me and call me to tell me how sorry they are. And it almost hurt me because I wanted, I, I was telling both of them how sorry I am. Like, I feel like I messed up. I did something wrong. They were like, no, like, I realized, and it was like, this wasn't years later. I mean, this was in like six months. Like, I realized what I had. I wish I still had you as a coach. I wish I still would be able to be around you. Like, I was ungrateful. And that kind of sucked because I, I wish I could have did more to, to show them before it got to that extent. And, but to see at least they got a second chance, both those two guys, they got a second chance and now they're both making the best of it. I mean, that's all I can ask for. And I'm always willing to help guys that I coached in the past, even guys that I guess, you know, didn't sign with me. I, I've seen so many guys who didn't sign with someone and they go on and they have professional careers. It's crazy. Oh, even on, in that aspect, so many guys that maybe sign with someone else and they go pro, but yet they still contact me once they pro. And they went, they chose to go to a whole different school. And I, I've never like, oh, forget that guy because he went to that school. No, he did what was best for him and his family. So I'm, I'm not, I'm not an egotistic, like I did this, I did that. Right. Or if you, you, you didn't come with me, forget you. I'm, I, I've never been like that. I never will. Well, and I guess I was setting up for the follow-up question is knowing that these types of cases exist, you know, does that, how, how measured are you when you see another potential recruit out there it, that, that might fit this category that can you go after them? How much, in, how much time can you invest into it before you decide I have to move on because it might not be the right fit for the program? Uh, you know what, for me, uh, this, this is gonna be crazy to say now, there's certain things where I understand you can't touch a recruit because of certain things that maybe he's done, right. but if you can still touch them, I'm still going to recruit them. The simple fact is, like, I, I made a ton of mistakes growing up, a ton. I, ma I made a lot. And I was fortunate enough to have the right people to stick by me, whether it was my parents, whether it was my, you know, my siblings, my family. But also at the same time, I had a lot of coaches that believed in me. And 
those guys helped also mold me and they were part of my process and part of my journey to be where I am today. So I, I can't say like, you know, just because they say, okay, he's not a good student or because all of a sudden he decided to do something that maybe wasn't the greatest decision. That doesn't make him a bad person, you know? So it, it's one of those things where you have to make sure the person is the right person still fit for the program. Right. Did, is he a, is he, you know, is he a terrible person or did he make one bad decision? That's drastically dis different. If he's a bad, yeah. malicious person, then yeah, that's different. You know, he's not good for the program. He's not good for a team atmosphere. He's not good for us or me. But if he made a mistake, that's a little different. Who are the who are who are, you, you talked about? You've been coaching for fifteen years. Uh, who have been the biggest influencers on you as, as a coach? Uh, I mean, shoot, I could go down the list. I hate to keep saying you know some of the same guys, but that's all right. You take Demetrius Martin, you take Tosh Lapoy, uh, you take, shoot, Cristobal, you take Mike Riley, you take Bob Diaco. I mean, you just, Marcel Yates, Keith Williams. I mean, it's, it's a ton of guys. Bobby Williams from Oregon, Keith Hayward. I mean, yeah. I keep going on and on of great people I've been fortunate enough to be around. And, you know, I've, I've learned so much from different individuals. And, you know, I've been, like I said, I've been fortunate enough to be around a lot of guys. Sometimes they say, you know, you learn things from people, you learn what to do and what not to do. I've been gratefully, you know, appreciative of, I've been around a lot of people, I've learned what to do. And, you know, so, and not just more than football coaches, great actually men. And, you know, that's what the biggest thing, I guess, you know, when it came to coming to SC, like me personally, I love Coach Houghton. He's been nothing but great to me. And he's a great man. So, and you can see mm -hmm. it because his family first is all those kind of things. And he's going to allow you to do your job. And right now, you know, with, with Mike and Brandon, they're doing everything possible to make sure we have the resources to do our, our job at the highest of levels. And when you give someone who already has hungerness, when you give someone who already has a great work ethic and everything else, and you give them all the right resources, the sky's the limit. I am Right now, you guys would normally be traveling around the country, visiting high schools and, and, and seeing kids. And, and, and next month, you'd be at camps and, and all that kind of stuff. Right. So you're doing everything virtually. What, I mean, how, what is your schedule? On, a t on Is there any such a thing as a typical day, but just your average day for you? I mean, just I'm, I'm going to wake up at probably about 7 a.m., uh, maybe a little earlier. But I'm going to wake up around there. I'm going to probably jog maybe about three miles real quick on the treadmill. So I'll go ahead and try to do that every day. I try to beat the time I did the day before. So I'll do that and do light lift as far as that. And then I'll come in the kitchen, make a quick breakfast, take a shower. And then around like eight o'clock, uh, I'm on some kind of FaceTime or some kind of Zoom and I'm the whole day. And then, you know, now since we're back meeting with our players, we have a set time where I meet with those guys for Zoom for maybe about an hour to an hour and a half. Uh, we have all kind of staff meetings and different kind of meetings that involve the coaches that I make sure I'm a part of. And then the rest of the day is now FaceTime and Zooms with different prospects. And, you know, before I got on this call, I was just on a Zoom with a, with a prospect for over two and a half hours. So, I mean, it's, it's one of those type of things. So when I get off this call, I'm probably going to play video games with one or two of them for probably about the next two hours, and I'm probably going to be right back on the Zoom. I mean, it's – Are you any good? Uh, I'm good. I don't know about all of them. but So, I mean, I'm, so you got game. Yeah, I'm pretty good. I hate losing. <laughs> so, if it's a game that I think I may lose it, I'm not going to play that yeah. game. I'm not playing just for fun. This is, not, this is not fun. This is for me to make sure I show you who's boss. <laughs> hey, well, okay, well, on to the competition thing and hating to lose, all right? Well, I hate to lose, too. I mean, I'm in different ways. The stuff, the stuff I'm competing for is trivial compared to what you're competing for. <laughs> it's all the same. But, I mean, does, does the thought that somebody is, is maybe working harder than you, is that a big motivator? Because it is for me. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't like to feel like – it's one thing. You, like I say, someone – you can choose a school because maybe the school has a better degree. But I'm fortunate enough I'm at SC, so I don't feel anyone has a better degree. But – you know, just different reasons why maybe, you know, I don't want to leave my particular region. I get that. But the one thing that I refuse to lose at is because someone outworked me. 
Maybe someone decided to talk to you for 30 minutes longer a day. Maybe someone decided to have a better way to present information to you because that's, that's what it's about for me. I mean, Coach Houghton said it best. He even said it today. He said, you know, I have nothing to do with used car sales or nothing like that. My best, my, my biggest attribute is to make sure I present information to you. And it's, you know, a lot of things is about how you present that information. I guess that's, that's key. And if all of a sudden maybe me stand up, I don't know, to three o'clock in the morning to put together a better PowerPoint presentation to present it to a family, then I need to do that. So it's definitely not going to be because someone outworked me. Maybe they got a different avenue, but that's not going to be the reason why. On the fun competitive side, inside the, with, your, with the rest of your coaching staff, you guys have brought a huge amount of new energy and, and, and a vibe around the program. You touched on it earlier that I haven't seen in a while. And you're right, the, the alumni, the Trojan family, the fans, they're, they're starting to feel it again. And it's because of the communication. Now, with that, on the competitive side, when you guys are recruiting and all these hype videos are coming out, do you, are you guys getting after each other to see who can come up with the, the next best one? Are you suggesting uh, ideas? No, you know what? It's not, it's not to the point to where it's like, you know, sometimes you have a big brother, little brother, and the little brother always wants to be better than the big brother. Sure. We haven't got to that. It's so much more of that, the happy family. Like, you know, like we all want to support each other so much. Granted, are we all competitive? Yes. But at the same time, for us to achieve what we want to achieve, we all have to do it together. You know, nobody is perfect. And, you know, if it's one day that I'm almost maybe an overall 97 instead of 100, trust me, Craig is going to make sure I get to 110. You know that? <laughs> so trust me on that. Like, the, the energy is, is just completely different. <laughs> and like, you, you take the other day, I must have got a text from T.O. at like 10 o'clock at night, like, what are you doing? Like, I'm bored. I need to do something. Tell me what you need help with. Like, and this is like 10 o'clock at night. Like, what do you need help with? Give me something to do. I'm like, I don't have nothing. Like, <laughs> I love that though. Yeah. I, was, <laughs> I do, I do too. Love, but that's that's that how everyone, is. instead of, you know, like, I, so many people can make excuses about what's going on right now in the world. But I definitely will say this, like, we're not making excuses. We hitting it full force head on. And we're trying to make sure that we're problem solvers. And I guess that's the biggest thing. We're trying to still make sure we're able to achieve everything which we want to achieve. You know, like it's an old saying that, you know, like your goals and your dreams don't care about your feelings. You can be in your feelings all you want every day, but your goals that you have, they don't care about that. So, you know, we're, we're all getting up every day and making sure we achieve our best. We want to ask some questions about the uh, about his guys, Mark. Yeah. All right. So, with your your group back there in the secondary, they each you know obviously bring something different to the table. Um, would it be fair to say that Chris Steele is probably the most confident, um, at least maybe vocally? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. They got a battle. Uh... Because okay, watching, watching the one-on-one -on -one battles between the DBs and the wide receivers, we only got to see it one day during the spring, but I've seen it in the past winter conditions when I'm not supposed to be looking. Uh, they're fun, man. They're fun. Yeah, I, I, we have quite a few guys that are really, really confident. And yes. that's even Tyler Noah, who couldn't even step on the field as a safety. I mean, extremely confident. You take – Greg is extremely confident. Like Max, he doesn't talk much, but is extremely confident. Chris, Chris is going to let you know he's confident. OG is extremely confident. I, I mean, you just go down the list. I remember the first day, I, I, I guess we had a meeting. And I said something to OG about like, it was like something like he sucked or something. It was something, but, you know, <laughs> along those lines. I can't even remember. And he was like, who? Not me? He was like, I don't. Like. And he just kept, yeah. kept going. He was like, well, me and you could do a one-on-one. -on -one. You know, it's like, it is that kind of competitiveness, and that's how they all are. So it's, it's quite a few guys that are extremely, extremely confident. But the greatest thing I think, you know, going on is none of them have even came close to what they came to USC to achieve. Not one of them. Right. You know, whether that was win the conference, national championship, first-round draft pick, not one of those guys are close 
So we definitely, as a defensive staff and as a whole staff, have their attention. And you can tell just by now meeting with them over and over and over the, the, the importance of the buy-in. You know, it starts one way. It's like, oh, we got a new coach. And now it's to the point to where it is nothing like that. Like the buy-in now is so drastic that it, it's not even them buying into me. It's me making sure I buy into them. Speaking of that. Okay. On, on that. How do you know when the kids are bought in? I, I could just, I mean, like, for instance, like conversation right now that means mm-hmm. that we're all having, you can tell my attention because I'm laser focused. I'm in this screen. I'm in this conversation. So you can say no different than when you interview a kid or talk to a kid. You can tell when he's yeah. fully there or when he's kind of like, and right now those guys are like this. It's tunnel vision. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was going to say, one, one of the guys I've noticed in your group who's really laser focused right now um, is Isaac Taylor. Um, he is, uh, do you have to tell him to kind of tone it down a little bit with his workouts? Uh, no, because right now, I mean, he knows his body a lot better than I do. Okay. Right? So, and we have a, you know, good training staff and, you know, Russ leads those guys and they're, they've been checking in on him on a daily, making sure as far as his rehabs and everything else. So, you know, how like right now, it's a, a lot of stuff going in the world. And some people may have a rehab and they may show up five minutes late or, Whatever the case, sometimes, you know, it's different things going on in the world just right now. He's one of those guys that is early for it. He does extra, like he is full steam ahead of making sure he comes back better than what he was. And you can, he's another guy who you can tell when he, when he buys in. You know, we first start having conversations. I will kind of have a conversation with him and he may look at the ground a little bit. Now those conversations I have with him, it's nothing like that. Just even the, mm. the other day, I guess we was on a FaceTime and I just had to tell him something. And, you know, he was laying down in bed and because it was still early in the morning. So he's laying down in bed. I'm talking to him on FaceTime. I'm like, Isaac, get out the bed. So instead of him having an excuse, instead of him saying something, he hopped out of the bed, you know. So you can tell when you have a kid's full attention and they have mine also. Awesome. All right, so you're from L.A. and USC. I mean, we've talked about USC over the years a little bit, just like just a little bit. Um, and conversations obviously with my there already I don't remember the direction that was far different than maybe a year ago I, I'm sorry I lost the, my internet All right. I, I, second. So, I, I, coming to USC it's a, you're from LA this is where family is uh, you know it's a great university but you know, USC had been a program where a lot of you guys were like wondering is USC broke you know th- there's a lot of stuff going on there was a lot of talk going on. I'm not saying you were saying that, but what, what did Mike Bone present to you that made you confident that USC was going in, in the direction that we're seeing it going right now? Uh, you know what? It wasn't nothing that he didn't present to me. Like, his, when he uh, actually got a chance to call me, and he called me multiple times, I can hear the vote of confidence that he had in the program. And... Mm-hmm you know when you have the right leader. You know when, you know, you ask someone a question and it's kind of like they're, they're thinking, like they don't know what to answer. And everything I stepped on that phone call and I was able to ask him, he already had the answer. So when you already have the answer like that, that tells me someone that has a plan and they know what they got themselves involved into and they know what they're going to do to fix everything. And you can tell he was someone that this wasn't his first job this wasn't going to be his first turnaround you could tell it was something that he already had done in the past and he already had an agenda had a plan and he knew how to apply it and what he was going to do and you already see it starting to take place right now would you have come to usc if you would have felt that maybe it wasn't a program that was going in a direction that could win a a championship no i mean i'm too competitive to feel like i'm just going somewhere to take a job like for one SC is, is a lot bigger than just a job to me. Like this mm-hmm. right here is like, this is what I grew up on. This is what I know. Like this is, this is life to me. This is not a job. So it would, it would be extremely hard to go somewhere like feeling like I'm just going to just 
just golf to lose or just going to just compete. Like it's a lot more than that. Like I'm here to be the best. I'm here to make sure that all of us are the best. And then everyone that you talk to in the building, they all have the same agenda to make sure we're second to none. I'm sure, you know, I'm stating the obvious here. Before you got to USC, you obviously had, you know, spoken to a lot of the, the, the kids on the roster. Um, when you got to USC, though, were you surprised by the talent level there? Uh, no, because a lot of these guys I recruited in the past, and if I didn't recruit them, like, being in a conference and all that stuff, like, you do evaluations over everybody. Right. right? So I, I had an idea what the talent level already was. I think uh, it's about, you know, quite a few schools in this conference that has really good talent. <laughs> really, really good talent. Some of them, just yes. because they don't maybe have a, a guy who's a five-star guy doesn't mean that they don't have talent. Like, they right. developed that guy, and they found him, and they hit him, and whatever, and signed him on signing day. But uh, there's quite a few teams with talent in this league, and we're fortunate enough to be one of them. The biggest thing is making sure it's, it's one thing to just have the talent. The next thing is to make sure you develop the talent and a, a basis of trust. Because it's different when you recruit a guy. When you recruit a guy, you sit in the living room. Your parents get to know you a little better. So it's already some bit of a trust before they step on campus. When you already come and you, you're coming as new coaches already into a staff, right, you have to get those kids to buy in. And you don't know how many coaches they had before you or, you know, just different things, right? Different – everyone has a different agenda. You may have someone who's like, I don't care after this year. I'm going to be a first-round draft pick. You may have another guy who's all about the team. Everybody has – million different agendas. The biggest thing is make sure we all have the same agenda. That's what matters. And if we're all on the same page and have the same agenda, everybody's going to get what they want out of this. If we all have a whole bunch of different agendas, it's like a whole bunch of di different independent contractors trying to build a house. The house is going to be terrible and it's going to fall apart. So the, the biggest thing is making sure we're all on the same page. And once we're all on the same page, which we're moving in that direction right now, then anything can happen. What are you looking for? What, what is, when you offer, offer a kid, what, what, are, what are you looking for? What, what is that kid able to do as, as a defensive back? Uh, I mean, the biggest thing is, like I say, do you love football? That's my number one thing. Uh, and then I look for certain intangibles. And it's, it's weird to say because it's not just a defensive back. It's more of the exact position I would like for you to play within the defense. Hmm. Position has different intangibles. I don't recruit just defensive backs and just throw you on the field and we just decide where you're going to play. I have to look for certain intangibles mm -hmm. for certain positions. And you almost, that's why you have certain guys that tell you, oh, well, I'm, I'm going to play boundary corner or field corner or nickel or boundary safety or field safety. Like, it's certain intangibles to play those spots. And that's what, you know, what we're looking for right now. And we have, we're fortunate enough to have a couple guys on the team that can play those spots now. And we're going to make sure we continue to grow and, you know, get better and better. How do you so that leads me to this. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just get to bang this, this follow-up. In that, in that uh, a, a parent told me, and I have been multiple parents, um, said that, that you guys are doing the best job of, at least with these two or three people, um, of detailing what – you see for their kid? I mean, how, how, how do you go about conveying, you know, those details on how you see them fitting in? Uh, well, the biggest thing, because like so many people could say, like, are you going to be a first-round draft pick? That's a lie. Nobody knows that. You have to stay healthy. You have to develop and everything else. But the greatest thing you can give anyone right now is your time. And the reason why we're able to detail things out is because right now we are so willing to give people our time. You know, and that's our number one priority is making sure it is detailed out. So whatever question, concern, issue you may have, we're able to make sure we answer. And if I can't answer, I'm going to make sure I find someone else that can. And you can see like the it within our whole staff. I mean, you take even like Spencer, for instance, who's, you know, head of the recruiting and everything else. Last night, I came up with some idea at 11 o'clock at night. So I text Spencer. I'm like, yo, you awake? He responded right back. And he's like, yeah, call me. I called him. He's wide awake. And me and him have a conversation about something at 11 or something at night. I mean, that's just yeah. how it is. So we're all willing to give each other's time. None of us is like, oh, it's, it's midnight. Like, what do you want? Like, that's not happening. And it's so many people like that, 
you know, you take Drew, for instance, like when it comes to maybe even a, a tour or something, there's so many people that are involved in touching these kids. You can see that we're all investing our time. And that's why I think we're so detail oriented. And if you're willing to invest your time in someone right now, you can only imagine when they step on campus and you're able to be in their face and truly coach them, truly develop them and truly mentor them to become a man. But if you're not willing to give someone your time now, why would you give them your time then when they step foot on campus and they may be a group of 10 guys, they may be number 10, but we're not, that, mm -hmm. that's not us. That's not who we are as people. How, how, how concerned are you right now, Coach, about, you know, obviously the, you know, the, the COVID situation we're dealing with. You, we're starting to hear, not so much reports, but a lot of talk um, about the local kids possibly leaving the state to, to go play ball their senior year if they can't play here in California. Have you, has that discussion or conversation come up at all? As far as high school kids? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, that discussion has not came up, but that's, you know, way, way above my pay grade. That's something that, you know, I, I guess the CIF and the city section and all those things will have to decide to make sure everyone's health and, you know, in their, be their best interest. I'm just starting to know, you know, there's some parents that are, you know, maybe they're floating it out there as a joke or, or not, but there is some talk about, you know, hey, if, if they're not going to be able to play here and we... I think it's about exposure and wanting to make sure that the kids can get as much opportunity for you and other coaches around the country to see them play. Uh, I guess where I was going with this, would you encourage that or would you tell them no, you know, stay home? Uh, yeah. I mean, that's, that's hard to say because I, everybody's family situation is different. Like, you know, granted, I would love all the best players to be at SC, but we can't take them all. I mean, we only have so many spots just like anyone else. So, everyone's situation is a little different, you know, and the family situation financially may be a little different. So I have, you know, that's, that's a, a case by case type of type of thing. It's not really a generic answer. It's like this particular person, maybe he should, this particular person, no, he shouldn't, you know. Hey, it's a weird time. So I figured, yeah. you know, yeah, this is, it's, it's crazy, but yeah. We won't keep you forever, but um, keeping the keeping the local kids, West Coast kids at home, the top guys. You know, I'll, sometimes there's a commitment from an out of state kid, and of course, the feedback from fans is we don't need out of state kids. But what is the what as a coach that's recruiting, looking for the best players in the country? You know, is it, wouldn't it be kind of stupid to not go look in places like Texas and Florida and Georgia and, and Washington D.C. like you guys do? Uh, so I'm gonna look everywhere. <laughs> I'm gonna look anywhere. I, I'm I'm gonna find the uh, the best young man and the best player possible to fit us as a program and to fit us as a university to represent us. So I don't care if that player is in North Dakota. I don't care if that player is in Montana. I don't care if that player is in Alaska. And the list goes on and on and on. Wherever I need to go to make sure that it's someone who wants to get their degree. It's someone who. <laughs> you know, wants to achieve all their goals when it comes to football and everything else, that's where I'm going to go. So the sky, when it comes to SC, the sky is the limit. I mean, you go anywhere, shape, form, or fashion you want to go. All right. I want, for, for, for people like us, you know, we, we saw USC play Texas. So we have an idea of, of what that defense looked like. And, and Texas did a pretty darn good job against USC. But what, what are, what is, what is the defense that we're going to be looking at? Can you describe it at all to us? I, 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 we're not looking for details, but, you know, what is, what is this defense that, that we'll be watching? Uh, attacking, uh, very, very attacking, uh, multiple, uh, aggressive. Like uh, T.O. always has it. He says it all the time. He may say it about 50 times a day, which is hit and run. So you're going to see a lot of guys making sure that they're flying around to the football and multiple, make sure multiple hats are put on the ball. I mean, you're going to see guys running around and hitting guys. And you're going to see multiple guys on the field. As far as us making sure we have some type of rotation, it won't just be the 11 guys starters, the 11 guys that play. You will see a mm -hmm. lot of different on the field, making sure it's a lot of, you know, different scenarios where it'd be maybe more defensive backs or more D-linemen or more backers or whatever the case. And you're going to see different multiple sets. It's going to be almost like an offense that you see out there that's going to run different personnel and different formations. But we're going to be doing that on defense. Based off your conversations that you've had 
with Clay and, and others that, that were at USC last year. Should we anticipate practices being maybe more physical in 2020 than they were in 2019? Uh, it's hard for me to say because I didn't get a chance to see those practices. So I don't know what happened at those practices. Um, I just know that right now, we're definitely going to make sure we're a physical team. Well, that'll make a lot of people happy to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean the feedback on that part, is, it's, it's, it's nauseating to be quite honest with you, just the feedback you get on that because how does anybody know what's going on in other practices when Alabama's are closed, Ohio State's are closed, Notre Dame's are closed, you know, USC's just happen to be open, right? Um, were your practices open at Oregon? Uh, no, they, they weren't. Just like for, for family, friends, and, you know, the beginning, I guess, 15 minutes for media, and then they'll be closed. Okay. My, la my last question. When you, you, know, you only got a one spring practice, but um, in, in the build-up to that, in the, in the one spring practice, was the ball player that you saw on offense or defense that you're kind of like, damn, I didn't know he was that good? Uh, I mean, it was multiple. Uh, I guess on offense, I guess one that was a big plus to me is to finally see Brew McCoy. So when you see, a, you know, a guy that physically big running that fast, you almost feel like, okay, he's not really a receiver. He can't come in and out of breaks. But then you start seeing him come in and out of breaks. And mm -hmm. then you see a guy like Tyler Vons who is almost jogging a route but he understands receiver play so well. And he's coached up that the last second he puts his hands out and he catches a 50 yard bomb down the field. And he literally jogged the route, but he understand to put his hands out the last second and Keaton put the ball exactly where it needed to be. And next thing you know, you got to catch. So when you're able to see those kind of receivers and see that kind of quarterback, that's so accurate with the ball. I mean, those things are impressive to me. I mean, we had a lot of guys on, you know, that first practice that weren't able to practice, the first practice, and we never got a chance to get them on, on the field because when you have one uh, on defense, uh, I mean, just to, you see a guy like uh, EA, right? EA and I guess Drake are two guys, not only were they physically looking good from double A and, the, you know, the strength staff and everything else, but the way that they ran around on the field was really, really impressive to mm -hmm. me. I mean, when you see a 260 pound linebacker that's running around and he's one to hit any and everything, and you see a guy off the edge that can bend, like truly bend, like everybody says, it's one thing to get sacks, and sometimes people get sacks and nobody blocked it, right? But when you got a yeah. guy who actually bend the corner and almost like, it, it looks like, I, I don't know, like his shoulders darn near on the ground, and he's able to still bend and rip around the corner and you know, touch the quarterback. I mean, those are impressive things, especially for me as a as a DB coach. You get a guy in the middle of the field and somebody's running a crossing route. You got a middle linebacker who's almost trying to knock somebody's head off. And to tell a DB that maybe, I mean, it happens. You may get beat, but it's okay because here goes Drake with the sack. Like, woo, we're all happy. Yeah. <laughs> so that was impressive for me. Man, Drake, Drake Jackson won game. Drake Jackson, I think one game last night seemed like he played every position on defense. <laughs> he played like middle linebacker, rush the pass. Like he probably can. We're going to put him out there in corner and let him do a cloud corner and just go ahead and just beat receivers up. <laughs> he's kind of liking his new physique right now. So he's kind of walking around looking at mirrors like he's a, like he's a cornerback now. <laughs> yeah. I saw a video of him probably the other day and he was doing backflips. I'm like, no, stop doing flips. I know. At some point, <laughs> come on. <laughs> it's, fun, it's fun for us to watch, but, I mean, as a coach, I'm thinking, anyway. Mark, you yeah, have one last question? I actually, I have a couple, but I, on this one, um, if you can briefly, I know losing is a great motivator, but what motivates you in life? Uh, I just want to be the best. So I guess what motivates me is to just feel like someone else is beating me in anything. I guess that, that motivates me. I'm, I'm one of those people that if I lose anything, like whether it's even a video game, if I lose in a video game, I may not play the video game for a whole nother week against someone else, <laughs> but that doesn't mean I'm not playing by myself for multiple hours a day to make sure that doesn't happen again. Now, if I win, I'm okay, I'll keep playing. But if I lose, I am done, and it's like practice mode now against the computer or whoever else. But I guess that's, that's just how I live my life. I, I just want to compete and 
and be the best at everything. I guess the moment that, you know, I stop wanting to compete is when I lose my edge and my hungerness. And I, I love learning. Like, I love to just continue to, to develop. I always feel that as a man, the moment that you feel like you know everything, you're done as a man. You can, your, your growth is done, whatever the case may be. So, you know, I'm one of those guys who will listen to someone else speak or do something for 10 hours just to take one thing. If I, I'll listen to you all day for 10 hours to take one thing. But like I always told a player this. I said, you know what? You, you may not like watching film, but if I told you every time that you watch 10 extra hours a week of film without me, if you watch 10 extra hours a week, every week you'll be guaranteed an interception. How many of you guys would do it? They all raised their hand. So yeah. it's kind of like one of those things where it's like in football and in life, you have to be willing to give your all without any kind of guarantee of success. And if you're not – able or willing to do that, you're done. Mm -hmm. Now, and just so we can help wrap this up, do you, um, my last question, where was the last restaurant you actually were able to sit down in and enjoy company with friends, family, teammates? And what's the next restaurant you're going to go to when they say you can go? Ah, the last maybe. place I was able to sit down at was Cantor's. Man, the last one that I went to, uh, I can't remember which one it was. It was either Bo or Mastro's. <laughs> I'm giving like shots out, but it was it was either Bo or Mastro's, and we I do that often. That, that would that would be one of the first places that I'm back at because right now I feel like I haven't had a steak in forever. So, you know, I hope we were just talking know, about that. Yeah, I hope. <laughs> Hopefully no one's around when I have this steak because I may eat it like a savage. So. <laughs> well, Gavin yeah. might have one of those extra tomahawks for you. You might want to just head over to his place. Yeah, right now Gavin, Gavin's being stingy, but Gavin shows me pictures of, of tomahawk, of lobster, all kind of crazy stuff. I'm just going to go over there and just, you know, when he turns his head, I'm going to eat everything <laughs> on the grill. <laughs> yeah. See, Gavin neglects to tell everybody that he didn't actually grill any of it. No, Gavin <laughs> says the pitcher stands over it. Man. His wife or someone else is actually the one cooking it. That's, that's how Gavin is. We love you, Gavin. Anyway, all right. <laughs> actually, you know, I do have one last question because it's this all ties around LA, and and right now, you know, the the excitement level, you know, from from kids in LA, the guys that are from LA on the USC football team, you're back um, around a lot of people you know really really well. Um, you know, the Chris Claiborne's, the Willie McGinnis, and even like Derek Holmes, for example, you know, just guys you grew up with and you know really well. How, I mean, what, what is that like for you now finally being able to be back in LA and have all of that element involved in your life again? Uh, to be honest, it makes my job easy. So it's, it's, I mean, it's one thing when you, when you work extremely hard, like I say, and you have to be willing to work extremely hard without any kind of success. But right now I'm able to work so hard and I'm able to have success because the people around me, mm. you know, one thing for me to sit up here and be like, Dante did this and Dante did that. No, Dante didn't. Right now I'm having a lot of success because of the people around me. And I don't, I don't see that happening because like I said, if you treat people right, they do right by you and vice versa. And it's so many people that have helped me become who I am today and has helped me along the way. Uh, and I'm sure they will can continue to do that because I'm going to continue to help them in every way I can also. So I, I guess right now, a lot of my success that I guess is going on and hopefully that will continue is because of the people around me. And I mean, it's, it's like taking candy from a baby. It's, it's great when there's so many people around you, I guess. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, man, I, I appreciate you taking it. This is a long time we had you here. So I, I really appreciate you doing this. Uh, it's, 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 it's a lot of fun to watch what's happening right now. You know, when you get to know you guys on the coaching staff and so on, you know, a lot of the guys that we don't talk about very often that are inside putting in the work, um, you know, you mentioned a few of the guys, uh, like Trey, um, it just, you know, I talk to those people. I just, I just, the excitement level and the, and just, they're just having a lot of fun. So it's, it's fun to watch you guys have you know, doing what you're doing right now. I mean, I know it's, it's like the, only the second, third inning right now of, of a year, yeah. but anyway, it, it's, exactly. it's fun to watch. And I can tell you guys do actually genuinely like working with each other. You know, that doesn't always happen. Correct. Correct. It's one thing for you just to, you know, 
work with somebody because you respect them. It's a different thing to work with someone because you respect them and you genuinely like them. And yeah. that's where we are right now. And it's, it's great. It's fun. I mean, you can't fake it. That's the, and the results speak for themselves also, you know, so. And again, thank you very, very much for doing this. Hopefully we'll see you soon in, in person. Um, yeah. But again, thanks for doing this, Mark. Yeah, Coach, thanks again. Um, you know, I, I wanted to real, real quickly, um, you, you have a cousin who coaches at Long Beach City College who played at USC also? Yes. Uh